Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Let's try it one more time. There we go. All right, welcome to Discovery. Welcome to the gathering. My name is Steve. This is my friend. And we are your host uh, today. Um, it's kind of nice to be able to walk in and uh, go through the front door, right? So uh, we continue to stay flexible with all the construction that is going on, but it does look like for the foreseeable future anyway, we can go back to what I would call the old way of parking over here in the parking lot, coming through the front door, um, and let's just hope and pray that that continues as the project unfolds. So anyway, thanks for making your way in here. It's good to see all of you and to be together today. One of our main goals when we gather on Sunday morning is to create as many opportunities for you to connect and feel plugged into the life of our community. And one of the best ways to do that is to visit the connection tent, which is in uh, the lobby. Actually, not the tent. The tent's outside. The table is in the lobby, and there's some wonderful people there who would love to say hello and all kinds of information available there. Um, if you're not able to stop by the table today, you can always check out what's going on through our webpage, our app, social media. There's lots of different avenues to find out about what's happening in our community. But again, the primary goal for us is connection and building those relationships. So take advantage of those opportunities. If y'all could go ahead and stand, <laughs> we can go ahead and begin our gathering with a reading from Psalm 119. You are my portion, Lord. I have promised to obey your words. I have sought your face with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. I have considered my ways and have turned my steps to your statutes. I will hasten and not delay to obey your commands. Though the wicked bind me with ropes, I will not forget your law. At midnight, I rise to give you thanks for your righteous laws. I am a friend to all who fear you, to all who follow your precepts. The earth is filled with your love, Lord. Teach me your decrees. Good morning, church. It's good to be here. Let's stand for worship today.
so loves the world Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever pray. Worthy of every breath we could ever pray. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one that could ever sing. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
We just thank you that you alone are where we can put our trust, God. That you are the rock, the rock of ages that we can hide in. God, and you say that we didn't choose you first, you chose us, God. So we just respond to that, your choosing of us today, God. God, that regardless of wherever you've been, God, that you choose us time and time again. God, will you speak to us today? We love you. All right, you may be seated unless you are headed to Discovery Kids. In that case, you may go ahead and be dismissed to the double doors to your left, and our volunteers will be over there to go ahead and take all of you back to our Discovery Kids. Um, like Steve mentioned earlier, we have a lot of ways to to connect here at Discovery. Um, we have the Connections tent, which Steve did mention is outside, and then the table that is inside. Um, both are great ways to just get connected to our church to learn more about um, who we are, what we do, um, and just to let you, um, yeah, get more connected with our community. Um, but you can also get more connected with our, um, our website at discoverydavis.org, um, and it can get you um, just a little bit more knowledge about kind of the events that are going on here, um, like men's retreat, which is coming up pretty soon. Um, so September 8th through the 10th, you guys will be going out to uh, Camp High Sierra, which is a little bit outside of Yosemite. Um, just some time for community, um, time to just hang out, um, eat some good food, um, camp out, that kind of a thing. You'll be in cabins, actually not camping. But um, yeah, some time it, just to hang out. It's a good time. Yeah, it's a, a good, time. good time. What I've heard, it's a good time. Um, yeah, so <laughs> you guys have that to look forward to. Um, we're also... Um, participating right now in a, a backpack drive where you guys can um, get supplies ready for some um, elementary students for this upcoming school year. Um, that's going on right now. We're partnering with, with one elementary school, is that correct? Um, and so you guys can prepare backpacks um, for students this year. Um, that's going on today and also next week, so feel free to bring backpacks by for that. Yeah, and that's a great example of one of our core values, our core strategies here at Discovery even, is this idea of generosity. And we've been doing that backpack drive for many, many years now. We partner with Marguerite Montgomery uh, Elementary. It's the only Title I school here in Davis. And um, I've had the privilege of being able to be the person who drops those off each week or each year when we do the drive. And uh, Daisy, who's the coordinator at the school, has been there for a while. And so we kind of have this yearly tradition now where we meet up and and pass those off, and they are so grateful for it. It is a huge deal. It, it's a. It, it may not seem like that that big of a thing, but for a kid to be able to start the year off with the supplies that they need, with a new backpack, um, can go a long way, right? Towards uh, towards helping that student engage with school and be excited about the new year and all of those good things. Um, and it's just been a really uh, neat thing. Um, our, my kids go to that school. And uh, for our church to love that school in that way and to continue that relationship has just been a powerful thing um, that, uh, to be a part of, but also to see it continue and, and even potential for that to grow uh, as that relationship flourishes between us and the school. Um, speaking of generosity, every week when we gather, we do pause for a moment to reflect on God's generosity towards us and his invitation to participate in that with him through the ways that we use our time, our talents, but also our treasure. And I don't know about you, but um, sometimes this part of the gathering can become a little bit of like white noise. And usually I'm over there getting ready to teach and, and kind of in the zone and not really thinking about it. But one of the things that I do love about the way in which we uh, come back to this week in and week out, similar to communion, which is what we're going to be talking about here in just a moment as we continue our conversation in Mark, is that these are very tangible, real, practical ways in which we engage with the good news of Jesus, the gospel, right? That God loves us, right? That uh, he invites us into his great and generous love. 
And not only is it good news for us, but it is good news that we get to share with other people. And so as we think about what it means for us to give here, we like to say that this is a get to and not a have to. We don't pass the bags uh, or anything like that. There's no pressure to give. But if you would like to participate, there is a, a, a black lockbox uh, at the connections table that you can drop um, something into or you can give online um, and through our app. But whatever the means through which you give, Again, this, this invitation to tangibly participate, just like when we come to the table and, and take those elements, this invitation to tangibly participate in the good news of Jesus, this weekly reminder of that is, I think, a really good gift for us. So I want to ask you to join me in praying for, uh, for our <clears throat> offering today, and, uh, and then we'll move on to the next part of our gathering. Heavenly Father, we are uh, deeply grateful for the truth that you have loved us so much that you have loved us despite our flaws, our shortcomings, our sin, our rebellion. That you have gone to every length possible, even sending Jesus to live, to be with us, to teach, to uh, demonstrate what your kingdom of right relationships looks like. And ultimately for him to give his life and for the gift of life that that is for us. So as we enter this moment, God, this is not just about um, doing a good deed or uh, checking a religious box. This is about a worshipful, missional, sacrificial response to the good news of who you are and what you have done for us. The good news of your generous, lavish love that you extend to each and every one of us. Would you take what we are able to give, would you multiply it many times over so that many people are able to experience, to know, and to discover the good news of Jesus. We pray this together in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Hey, um, while I'm up here, I wanted to take a moment, um, and actually I'm going to invite the elders to come and join me on, on stage. We wanted to take a moment and update you guys on some upcoming staff transitions. So here in Davis and, and here at Discovery, we have um, people who come and go, and it's just part of the nature, I think, of, of this community and, and where we live. Um, and in the beginning of the summer, we take time to you know, honor our graduates and, and people who are tied into the academic year. Um, but this year, we do have some transitions coming up with our staff team, and so we wanted to share about two of those with you this morning. Um, the first one is Carrie Palmer, who has been our administrative guru, director of operations, master of all things behind the scenes that happen. Um, she has been pursuing for a while now a full-time position with DJ USD, and she got offered a job, and she's going to be taking that and moving into that role, which is very exciting for her. Um, you guys can clap for that. Um, and celebrate that. She's not here today. They're still on vacation. They'll be back with us um, uh, this week, actually. Uh, so if you get a chance to see Carrie, we'll take some time to actually honor her in person later on. But if you see Carrie, uh, say congratulations, give her a high five, and say thank you. Because there's so many things that, have, that do happen, that have happened because of her uh, faithfulness and hard work behind the scenes to keep uh, some of the wheels turning. So she's done at the end of the month. And um, we'll, again, have an opportunity to thank her and celebrate her a little bit later on. The other, uh, the other one is James and Megan Collington. I want to invite them to the stage now. And they're actually, because they're here with us today, they have the opportunity to share a little bit about what lies ahead for them. So give them a hand as they make their way to the stage. How's everybody doing? So, you know, it's always, uh, it's never a good thing when I have a mic without a, a guitar. So, uh, but yeah, some bittersweet news. Megan and I are going to be uh, moving at the end of the month. And, uh, you know, we're just firm believers that wherever God has you, uh, there's a reason and there's something he wants to teach you. And so just want to start, first of all, by just thanking the church and Discovery and the elders and everybody just for their generosity and just pouring into us over the years. Uh, it's probably like four years ago now that Steve sent me an email and was like, 
you want to come to Discovery? And we're like, all right. And um, so for us, like, we pulled the plug on a lot of things, relationships, churches. Megan had to start grad school over. And um, But just we just knew that the Lord was calling us here, and we've always had that sensitivity. And uh, as of recently, um, yeah, we just have been kind of sensing that there's another call for us. And so we're going to be moving to San Luis Obispo at the end of the month, and um, we're excited for that transition. And um, this Wednesday at 6 o'clock, we're going to be meeting at Community Park, just get together, bring some food, bring nothing, bring you, um, but you're all invited to that if you want to come say goodbye. So, uh, yeah, thank you for everything over the years, and um, it's bittersweet, but we love you guys. Um, In addition to Wednesday night, there also will be opportunities, uh, particularly on August 27th, which is our last church in the park. We're going to take some time to honor and celebrate the Collingtons during uh, during that gathering. So there'll be plenty of uh, time to say goodbye and again to say thank you for their contribution, their leadership, the gifts that they have brought to our community for the last three or so years. Um, so thank you guys. Appreciate you sharing that with us this morning. Um, you will be missed. And uh, I want to invite you in to just pray. Uh, you can just pray. Just pray. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's pray. Um, Heavenly Father. God, I just thank you so much for James, Megan, and the little baby inside. Um, God, I thank you for the blessing that they've been to this community here. God, I thank you that both James and Megan have experienced your love and have so generously shared that love um, with us as a community over the last three years, God. Um, yeah, we're going to miss them, God, but we're also excited Um about the opportunity that you've provided and the work that we know you will continue to do both in them and through them um, to bless the community in St. Louis Obispo, God. Um, so God, I just pray that you would um, be with them every step of the way, that you would bring them awesome community there, um, awesome friendships, um, and would it just be a sweet time um, for them as they make this transition. Um, God, I pray that um, for us as a community, we would be able to gather around and celebrate um, with them the times that we've had and also just continue to support them. Um, God, SoCal's not that far away. So God, I just um, thank you again for your goodness, for your grace, um, for your amazing love in all of this. I praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey guys, can you hear me okay? Oh yes, I can hear myself now. Awesome. <laughs> All right, well, good morning, Discovery family. Um, if you don't know me, my name's Ewan. I am one of the elders here at Discovery, and I have the opportunity this morning to continue our conversation in Mark. Um, you know, before diving in, I just kind of wanted to acknowledge that. You know, transitions are hard, right? They're both things that we celebrate, but also, um, you know, James, Megan, we will very much miss you both. Um, and, you know, things won't be the same. Um, and, you know, as I was preparing for this week and also kind of reflecting on these transitions, I think transitions are always a time to reflect on the universal communion of the saints, right? We get to talk about communion this morning. And I think one thing that's so amazing about the body of Christ is that around the world, whether it's here in Davis or down in St. Louis Obispo, or up in Canada, or in Germany, or Kenya, or India, or China, right? That every time the followers of Jesus come together and celebrate communion around the world, we're celebrating the same good news of Jesus, right? And that unites us um, as one body. At the same time, during times of transition, I think it's also a time to reflect on also the diversity of the local expression of church, right? That each church is also distinct and different for good reasons, right? Because each church is meant to be a local expression and meant to be cultural translators that help bring that good news to their local community and the people they're trying to reach in a way that can be heard, in a way that is accessible, right? And so this morning, as we dive into our topic on communion, that's the framework that I want us to approach with, right? That we would both celebrate the fact that we share this one good news of Jesus around the world and also to reflect on what does that mean for us right here in our local community? And what does that look like? And what is Jesus inviting us into? So if you guys know me, you know that I am ethnically Taiwanese. And if you know anything about Taiwanese people, you know that we love food. 
So I'm excited that we get to talk about communion today. Now, one time I was listening to Taiwanese radio, and the talk show hosts were basically talking about like the five surprisingly highest calorie foods at the night market in Taiwan. And you know, they go through this list, and at the end of that list, they're like, oh man, but those are five really good foods. So therefore, the conclusion is that you should go to the night market with your friends and share everything. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, right? That is totally the Taiwanese answer to that question, right? Um, because we love our food. Now, I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but there's something about American superheroes that is really interesting. Whether it's Batman, Superman, Captain America, they never eat. Have you guys noticed that? Like they might have food in a scene, but it's always like just in the backdrop because they're talking about something else or doing something else, right? Like they never slow down to enjoy food. Now if that's what you've grown up with. That might seem very normal to you, right? Like Batman and Superman, Captain America, they're out there saving the world. They don't have time to, you know, eat. But like in our Asian cartoons, whether it's Goku or uh, Naruto or even in, you know, um, Korean dramas, there are literally like entire half episodes dedicated to food. <laughs> and, what, and, and it's not just a side thing, right? It's literally half an episode dedicated to the preparation of the food, how excited they are about the food, and then when they finally get to eat, like the camera pans in and zooms in on all the different dishes that are like the favorites of these superheroes and they're gonna eat. And I just think that's so funny because right, culturally food is such a big deal um, in Asian cultures. Now, there is one thing that's really interesting about food, and I think this is shared across cultures, and it is that sharing a meal together has a way of bringing us closer together, right? Um, you know, I can spend hours and hours in meetings with my coworkers, but it is when we step out and go grab lunch together, not because it's a work meeting, but because we wanna grab lunch together, right? That we start to move from just being coworkers to being friends. Right? I can be on the basketball court with my teammates and go through the ringer of a basketball tournament, but it's in that moment when the tournament's all over and said and done, and we go grab dinner together as a team, right? that we start to move from just being teammates on the court to being friends. Right? Now I bring this up because thankfully, our hero Jesus is a hero who does eat. And he doesn't just eat, he spends entire episodes preparing for and being excited about sharing a meal with his people. And that's what we get to dive into today. And my hope as we come to communion is that I want to expand our view of the communion table. I want to expand our view to understand it not just as a remembrance of what Jesus has done for us in the forgiveness of sins, but also as an everyday invitation to dine with God, right? to dinner with Jesus as a friend, because he's inviting us into that. Now, I know communion, is, you grow, grow, if you've grown up in the church, is probably something that's super familiar. So sometimes it's kind of hard to expand a view of something that's super familiar, right? So I want to start us off with a question. So the other day, I was driving to get boba, as I so often do, and um, my daughter, Mabel, was in the back seat, and she was about to fall asleep, and I'm like, oh, no, you can't fall asleep because then you won't sleep at night, so I need to find a way to keep you awake. And I was like, oh, I have an idea. You can help me sermon prep. So I was like, hey, Mabel. And she's like, yes. And I'm like, so Jesus is a king, right? And Mabel's like, yes, Jesus is a king. And I'm like, okay, good. And what does communion represent? And Mabel says, communion represents Jesus' body and his blood. And I'm like, oh, good job, Mabel. And then I'm like, hey, Mabel. So what does Jesus' kingship have to do with communion? And Mabel's like, hmm? Baba, you're confusing me, right? And that is the question for us this morning. What does Jesus' kingship have to do with communion? So we're going to be in Mark chapter 14. I'm going to go ahead and read verses 12 to 31 for us. Um, we're going to just read that straight through as a story for our text today, and then we'll back up a little bit and unpack this. Should be on the screen, but you can also turn there if you're interested. So Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 12. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. 
follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me? It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips his bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Mount of Olives. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. All right, so in this passage here in Mark 14, we get this juxtaposition, right? On the one hand, you have Jesus setting the communion table, giving himself to his disciples. And on the other hand, you have his disciples betraying him, forsaking him, denying him, right? It's this crazy juxtaposition here. Now, we're going to come back to this passage, but before diving in, I want to back up a step and set the context and the stage for what's going on at this point in the story. So keep in mind, I mean, I know every week we come and we take, you know, a chunk of Mark, right? But back in the first century, when they got the gospel according to Mark for the first time, they would have read this in its entirety, right, as one big long story. So I want to take us back to Mark chapter 1 to understand a little bit what is Mark's thesis here, right? What is Mark doing and where is he going? So let's start at the very beginning with Mark 1.1. 1, 1. And it opens like this. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. All right, now let's pause there. Mark was written to most likely a Gentile Roman audience in the first century, most likely living in Rome. And that right there, that first sentence, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, has, would have been flashing neon lights to his original audience about where he's going with this. And there's three things that jump out. The first, when Mark says the beginning of the good news, the word good news here, right, euangelion is good message. And this would have been the phrase used to describe the coming of a new Caesar. When a new Caesar came to power, they would send out heralds and messengers that would have went to proclaim the good news that there's a new Caesar. So Mark's saying something right here with that. Then what does he say? He says Jesus the Messiah. What does the word Messiah mean, right? Christ, the anointed one. And who's the anointed one? The king, right? He's the promised king that was to come. Again, Mark is saying something here. And if that wasn't enough, he then throws in the phrase the son of God. Now, I know a lot of times we interpret that from a Trinitarian perspective, but in 55 BC, Caesar, Julius Caesar, declared himself to be divine. And then in 27 BC, Caesar Augustus declared himself the son of God in order to make a rightful claim as Caesar. And so this phrase, son of God, was being used by the Caesar of that day to describe himself as the rightful king. And again, Mark throws that in here to make a statement. So I think we're seeing that Mark is getting at something here, right? That Jesus is the rightful king. Now, if that wasn't enough in verse 1, he goes on in verse 2. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. Again, this is royal language, right? When you think about a king showing up, he sends a messenger before him to say, right, make 
The king is coming. The king is coming. Make straight paths so that the procession, the royal procession, can proceed through. Right? When the king shows up in town, you don't make them walk through winding crowds. Right? You make it straight for the king to go through. And again, we get that language here. And then if we jump down to verse 14 and 15 here, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Right, what is the good news according to Jesus here? It's that the kingdom of God has come. Right, that the king has come. And so Mark's thesis here, what he's setting up in the good news according to Mark, is very clearly setting up Jesus as the rightful king. And the question that Mark raises for us as he goes throughout his gospel is this. What kind of king is Jesus? And what kind of kingdom is Jesus establishing? And as you go on through Mark, you see that Jesus is a king who has power and authority over disease, over death. He has power and authority over spiritual forces. He has power and authority to forgive sin. He has power and authority over nature itself. Right? And you see that very clearly set up in Mark's gospel. And yet at the same time that he's setting up Jesus as the king with all this power, he also shows that Jesus is a king who hangs out with the lowly, right? who hangs out with the leper and the prostitute and the tax collector. And he is a king who came to serve and to give his life for many. Right? This is the picture of Jesus that Mark is painting. Now, with this in mind, let's go back to Mark 14. You see, in Mark 14, what we see is, on the one hand, is that Jesus is once again in complete control. Right? He knows what's going to happen. He's setting up this dinner. He's setting up the scene. He's in complete control and authority. And yet, at the same time, we see that Jesus is using his power and his authority to do what? To willingly walk into betrayal, to willingly walk into being denied and forsaken by his closest friends. Right? And I know a lot of times we talk about the passion of Jesus and his suffering, and we talk about you know, how the Roman soldiers had perfected the art of crucifixion and physical torture. But I think what we see here in this scene is relational, emotional suffering that Jesus willingly subjects himself to, right? That he's willing to be betrayed by his closest friends who spent the last three years with him. These are people who Jesus has been pouring himself into. They've shared in his teachings. They've done ministry together. They've seen his miracles. They've participated in his miracles. And yet, every single one of them is going to either betray him, deny him, or forsake him in just a few days. Jesus chooses in all his power to walk into this. And the irony of the moment, right, is that in this moment when Jesus' disciples are perhaps least worthy of his love, he chooses to say, I know everything you're about to do, all the ways you're about to forsake me, and I choose to love you anyway. Right? I choose to give myself for you. You know, we live in a culture, and we are part of a culture, and David said, it's very much achievement-oriented. Right? We like to believe that we, in some way, somehow, even if it's in part, deserve the things we get. Right? And sometimes we take that same approach with God. Right? We might know that we aren't ultimately deserving, but there might be a part of us that says, oh, at least I prayed today, or at least I tried my hardest, or at least I smile a lot, whatever it might be, right? And what we see in Mark 14 here in the good news of Jesus completely subverts that. Right? What we see here is that Jesus loves his people and gives himself for them on their very worst days. Not at all because they are worthy or deserving, but because Jesus, despite knowing all their past and future failures, has chosen to say, I love you and you're worth it. Right? 
And that's what Jesus is inviting them into. And so we come to this idea of communion, right? Jesus invites them to communion. Now, I want to unpack communion a little bit for us here because, again, for Jesus' disciples and seeing Jesus talk about this is my blood of the covenant, that would have been a flashing neon sign again. Now, the Passover meal would have been the most important feast and festival for the Israel people, right? This was their celebration of God saving them from slavery in Egypt, and not just slaving, saving them from slavery in Egypt, but then inviting them to be God's chosen people, right? And we see this in Exodus 19, when God says he rescued them from Egypt, and he's going to be their God, and they're going to be his people, and they're going to be a kingdom of priests, right? Now, what do priests do? Priests represent God to people, right? And so Israel was going to be God's chosen kingdom of priests to represent and to reflect God's goodness to the rest of the world. And that has echoes all the way back to Genesis 1-1 when God created men and women to be image bearers of God, right? To reflect God's goodness and to fill the whole of creation with God's goodness. And in Exodus 24, you know, after they established this whole covenant of, you know, this is how you're going to live as my people, there's this moment in Exodus 24 where then God invites the leaders of Israel to come. And they come and they're splashed with the blood of a lamb or a goat. And there's a moment where they say, yes, we're going to do everything you ask of us in the covenant. And then Moses splashes on them the blood and says, this is the blood of the covenant. And after that moment, the leaders are invited to come into the presence of God. And they're not stricken down, but instead they get to share a meal with God in that moment. And so when Jesus in Mark says, this is the blood of my blood of the covenant, he's taking them back to that moment and expanding on that and inviting them into something new. Right? Because the difference between the covenant and Exodus is that in covenant and Exodus required the Israelites, God's people, to make good on their end of the deal. Right? But we all know that as people, we are not so good at that. And so in Jeremiah, God, through the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah promises a new covenant. That one day he's going to make a new covenant with his people, this time not dependent on their ability to execute, but rather dependent on who God is, God himself. And that's what Jesus is doing here. He's inviting his people into a new covenant, not based on anything we can do, but based on who he is and what he's doing on behalf of his people. And in so doing, he's then inviting his people into his kingdom, right, to live in his kingdom of right relationship, right relationships with God, right relationships with each other, and right relationships with the whole of creation. So I started, you know, we started this morning talking about food and how eating together is a signal of friendship, right, of right relationship that brings us together. And what I want us to see in communion is that it's not just a remembrance of Jesus' sacrifice, but because of Jesus' sacrifice, there's an everyday invitation to walk with him, to dine with him, to be in relationship with him. I want to invite the band to come back up and, you know, there's perhaps the best picture I can see of this, of dining together in significance, is at a wedding. So you guys have probably been to a wedding or to a wedding banquet, right? And what happens in those moments? Right? Traditionally, there's a wedding ceremony, and then after the wedding ceremony, there's usually a wedding banquet, right? And now the wedding banquet isn't just because there's a bunch of people gathered together and you need to eat, although it is nice to have good food, right? But what the wedding banquet signifies is that when two families come together now and you share this meal, it's a celebration of sharing in this meal together, right? You guys are together now. And in the same way, 
as God invites us to be with him. This meal in communion is actually a small foretaste of the wedding banquet to come. Right? It says in Revelation that one day, right, we're all going to be invited to the wedding banquet or the wedding supper of the Lamb. And that's when we get to dine with God in the fullness of what this looks forward to. And again, our God is a God who loves to dine with his people, to be in communion with his people, to invite them to share in his table. And that's what we have in communion. So this morning as we prepare for communion, that's what I want us to sit with. To sit with that question again, of what does Jesus' kingship have to do with communion? And to realize and to recognize that Jesus is the king with all the power and all the authority. And yet he chooses to take that power and that authority in order to serve, in order to suffer, in order to walk into the brokenness of this world because he loves us, because he has declared us worth it, even on our worst days. And as we come to this table, I want us to be able to come into that grace of Jesus and then to look forward to the invitation that he's inviting us to, that we get to be a part of this new kingdom, this new covenant community that lives in right relationship and experiences and shares and passes on right relationship, even as we look forward to that great ultimate wedding feast when we get to all be together celebrating with Jesus when we are king. So let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for who you are and what you've done. Um, Lord Jesus, you are the king with all power and all authority, and yet you've chosen to take that power and to use it to suffer, to enter in to suffering, to enter in and experience betrayal being forsaken, being denied by your closest friends. And yet in your abundant grace and love, in those moments when we are the absolute weakest and undeserving of your love, you have declared us worth it and you have invited us to dine with you. God, that is mind-blowing and it is exciting. And we thank you for that invitation that you extend to us constantly um, that we get to come and be with you, God. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Giants we call death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came, then he died, and he rose. Those giants are dead now. This is our God, this is who he is, he loves us. This is our God. What he does. 
Discovery family, Jesus, because of who he is and what he's done, is inviting us to dinner with him, to dinner with the king of the universe. And my hope is that we go from this place, we would experience his love this week and reflect that love to those around us. Thanks for worshiping with us. Grace and peace, everyone.